Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, but if you're unable to join us on, on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Okay. For those of you not from the Nebraska Library Commission, uh, the Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Uh, so we are similar to your state library. So we have shows on Encompass Live that could be for all types of libraries. We could be because we provide services and programming and resources to all types of libraries in the state. Uh, so uh, public, academic, K-12, museums, correctional facilities, historical societies, all sorts of things. Uh, really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Um, we bring, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations about services or programs or things we're specifically doing here, uh, but we bring in guest speakers sometimes as well. And we have a mixture of that kind of today. Um, today is the last Wednesday of the month, so it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day, yay, which is, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the last Wednesday of every month, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, good morning, Amanda, she comes on and uh, talks about something techie related. Um, we may have other shows about tech related things throughout the month too, uh, but you can always count on Wednesdays. Uh, the last Wednesday of the month will always be Amanda talking about something like that. Um, so she is here with us today, of course, um, but she has brought, um, we have invited uh, some guest speakers to come in um, to join us and um, I will, and they're going to talk about this really cool project I think is so, so much fun, uh, FarmBot, um, growing, growing veggies and things with robots, which, yeah, just blows my mind, but it'll be cool. Um, so Amanda, why don't you explain, you know, how we, um, you, because you saw this presentation previously? Yeah, um, so I actually, I think we first met when you showed me Misty at one of the conferences, Dan. Yeah, I think yeah. I bet it's internet librarian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's go to meeting every, go to conference every year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've brought our now robot, Misty robot, and most recently this farm bot project. It's, and then when I saw this, I was like, Nebraska, robots, farm bots. Agriculture, <laughs> absolutely, yep. <laughs> yes. So we reached out to Dan and um, her team here, some of the members of the team to come talk to us about um, their project. So I'm really excited to hear about it, especially, um, you know, like you said, robots, agriculture, Girl Scouts, I mean, what could, what, there's nothing not to like here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think I'll hand it over to you, Dan, um, to uh, talk about, uh, you know, introduce yourself and um, take it away and tell us all about your project. Okay. Thank you so much, Krista and Amanda. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, so hello, everybody. I cannot see you, but my name is Dan Lowe. I'm the Library Program Coordinator at Palo Alto City Library. Joining me here today are Susan and Navika from Space Cookies. Space Cookies have been instrumental in our FarmBot project, and they played a vital role in making this project a success. Susan, would you like to introduce yourself first? Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Susan, and uh, I've been a mentor with Space Cookies for 10 years. And one of the areas that I spend a lot of time on is community outreach. Uh, since we are a Girl Scout troop, uh, serving the community is very important to us. And so when the library called and said, could you help us build this robot, we were more than happy to do so. Um, having a robotics project is um, just incredibly exciting to the girls um, because that's what they join our Girl Scout troop to do. Um, one of the girls who worked on the farm bot was Navika uh, and she's here with us today and I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell you a little something about Space Cookies. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Navika. 
I'm a senior in high school and I've been a member of Space Cookies for four years. Um, over those years, I've learned a ton about designing our robots to complete the annual assigned tasks and also collaboration within our team of 56 girls from 24 high schools based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've also been a member of Girl Scouts since first grade and I've worked on a lot of outreach in the past to help bring STEM and robotics to more people. Okay, thank you, Suzanne and Navika. Uh, so we are very excited to share our FarmBot project with you today here. FarmBot is an agriculture robot like um, Krista already guessed out <laughs> and uh, Amanda already saw it. Um, that, but we built it from scratch with the invaluable help of our amazing community. FarmBot is a very versatile machine that can perform a wide range of tasks like sowing seeds, watering plants, and capturing images. We have also implemented and executed several programs with great success. So you may be curious about the motivations behind this project and the process of the robot's creation. Today, we're going to provide you with insights into the background of our project, the challenges we encountered during its development, a glimpse into the capabilities of the bot, and ultimately, the lessons we learned along the way. So about six years ago, our library embarked on a series of grant-funded robotics programs, recognizing the immense value they hold in promoting digital literacy. So like Amanda already mentioned, um, our libraries have two beloved robots previously, Dewey and Elsie. Dewey, a now robot, and Elsie, a misty robot, have been instrumental in engaging our customers through coding workshops and their interactive performances in various programs and events. These programs made an impact in the community and won two national awards for the library. Drawing inspirations from the success of these programs, we took the decision to venture into the FarmBot project. So just before the onset of the pandemic, we submitted a proposal to the Pacific Library Partnership, outlining our vision for the farm bar. Recognizing the uncertainty ahead, we meticulously planned for various scenarios, including the worst case scenario of having to build a bot using our in-house talent. Fortunately, the Pacific Library Partnership shared our enthusiasm and commitment to this project. They graciously sponsored our initiative with an innovation grant, allowing us to bring our vision to life. To capture the essence of this project and its significance within the library community, we named it Harvest at the Library. Now, we often joke internally that it takes an entire city to build a farm bot, but that statement isn't far from the truth. Throughout our journey, we have received tremendous support from various city departments, especially during the challenging times of the pandemic. The Mitchell Park Community Center graciously offered a home for the farm bot, providing a dedicated space for its operations. The fire department played a vital role by conducting necessary fire inspections to ensure safety protocols were met for this project. The IT department stepped in and installed a new network specifically designed to support the robot's operations, ensuring the seamless connectivity and data transfer. Additionally, the Public Works Department played a crucial role in providing essential access to electricity and water, enabling the farm bot to function optimally. None of this would have been possible without the incredible involvement of the Space Cookies. They have been at the very heart of this project, assisting the library in assembling both the planter and the farm bot itself. Their expertise and dedication have been invaluable throughout the entire process. Together, this collaborative effort demonstrates the immense power of community support 
and highlights the incredible teamwork involved in bringing the FarmBot project to life. Now let's take a look at the basic timeline of our project. It encompassed various stages, starting from the initial planning phase, followed by design and procedure development. We dedicated significant time to hammer out the necessary preparation work, ensuring we had a solid foundation for the project. Then we move on to building the hardware components of the farm bot and tuning it with the software. The entire process spanned from 2020 to 2022 overlapping with the pandemic. It's a testament to the determination and the resilience of our team. Finally, after extensive testing and refinement, we proudly launched our programs, putting the FarmBot to work and showcasing its remar remarkable capabilities to the community. Indeed, the path from the initial grant proposal to a fully realized project has been a long and arduous journey. Along the way, we encountered numerous surprises and faced various challenges that tested our problem-solving skills. Out of all the robot projects we have undertaken, I must say that the FarmBot project stands out as the most complex and challenging one to date. So our journey began with the selection of the desired FarmBot model. The FarmBot company offered two options, the FarmBot Genesis and the FarmBot Express. To make an informed decision, we conducted thorough research to compare these models. FarmBot Express caught our attention at first with its ready-to-use appeal. It came pre-built requiring only placement on a planter to initiate its operations. Additionally, the Express model boasted a more affordable price point, making it an attractive option at first glance. However, we soon discovered that FarmBot Express was a relatively new product, and the company had not yet resolved all the issues within the system. While the Genesis model came at a higher cost and required more effort on our part as we had to assemble everything using the provided kit. Its reliability and quality were well established. The Genesis model had been in production for, around, for around four to five years by that time, ensuring that any potential issues had been resolved. Moreover, the use of the Raspberry Pi 3 in the Genesis model provided enhanced computational power than the Raspberry Pi compared to the Raspberry Pi Zero in the Express model. We decided that the FarmBot Genesis model was the most suitable choice for our project. Oh, I do have a question about that. Are there any other companies that do this besides FarmBot or are they just the one? Hmm. At that time, um, we think this is the, like the most like reliable mm -hmm. choice at the moment because this is you know agricultural robot, especially those ones facing the um, end consumers. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not that big a market. Um, <laughs> sure. so that's, yeah, that's the only one we know at that time. I'm sure there are others now. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said, it, um, that particular one being around for at least five years it definitely has a good track record, of, of course. <laughs> yes. And it started, you know, it started as, as an open source project starting in somebody's yeah, backyard. So yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good option for us. Cool. All right. Thank you. I've dug around looking for that, too, because I was like, that sounds kind of cool. <laughs> and I found some like instructions on instructables from people who put stuff together. Um, but it was like I'm pretty sure community's eyes would cross trying to go through that and follow and like do they update their code? Do they maintain it? Probably mm -hmm. not. And oh, 
that's a good point. They do have a, like a community website. So if you're a developer, they also have a developer portal. So people are sharing things they do with the FarmBot or issues that they run into with FarmBot on those platforms. And it's open to everyone. Like, and that's why I love that slide where you have the who's involved section on there because it's like most of those robot teams for the those like tech gadgets they only talk about the design process of the robot itself but mm -hmm. i love how this actually digs into everything that it takes and like all the different teams and subgroups that need the input and how to find alignment across all of them yes and it's like, you go farm bot <laughs> <laughs> That's actually very a very time consuming um, process because it happens, you know, right at the moment pandemic was taking on. So mm -hmm. it takes more longer time, and I have to give you know credit to the Pacific Library Partnership some credits again because usually their their grant period is only one year, but due to the pandemic they graciously offered us more time to working on it. Nice, awesome. The one yeah. good thing that did come out of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll move on to, okay, continue. There you are. Okay, so um, unlike the other robots we have at the library, FarmBot requires a dedicated and secure physical space as well as reliable access to internet, water, and electricity. Initially, we had planned to utilize the outdoor yard on the second floor of one of our branches. However, after conducting building inspections, it became evident that uh, that location is not ideal. So fortunately, the community center stepped in and great, uh, generously offered us a location that met all the necessary requirements. This new location happened to be right next to the library. This kind gesture from the community center provided us with the perfect environment to house and operate the farm bot. Now the next crucial step was to find a suitable planter that would seamlessly integrate with this robot. Researching the elevated planter market, we discovered that the available options were quite limited. However, we managed to identify a veggie chuck planter that stood out as one of the few viable choices. This particular planter met our criteria in multiple ways. It provided ample space to accommodate the minimum size requirements of the farm bot appeared sturdy and durable and featured flat sides and a level top surface devoid of any decorations. These design characteristics ensured an ideal surface for the farm bot to sit upon. In addition to selecting the planter, we also recognized the need to plan ahead for the procurement of soil and seeds. Now, I would like to pass the baton to Susan and Navika, who will share their valuable insights and experience with you in the upcoming few slides. They are the heroines of this project, and I'm excited for you to hear from them firsthand. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. All right, so um, no one at uh, Space Cookies had had any experience with the farm bot before this project. So um, we were all really learning by doing. Um, and on top of that, we had the challenge of trying to execute the farm bot during COVID. Uh, so before expanding on that particular topic, uh, let me mention something about that planter base that Dan just showed you. Um, for the space cookies, the team builds its robots from metal and hard plastics. So building the wooden planter was a fun new experience for the girls. Um, we just rarely do anything with wood. Um, <clears throat> and the long sides of the planter needed to be pairwise level. So they had to be completely level and they had to be um, level with each other. Uh, and the reason for that is because the overhead mechanism on the farm bot 
um, is completely rigid and it runs up and down the length of the planter. So if the two sides of the planter weren't perfectly level with each other, then you would get twisting and warping and the mechanism would break. Um, so we spent almost an entire session making sure that the planter was properly constructed. So the construction of the planter was relatively easy, but then we had multiple levels out there and we were just trying to test all directions to make sure that the planter was going to um, not warp on us. Uh, and so far it's done a pretty good job. So it was a very sturdy planter that we picked. Um, so next slide. Great. Um, so before we uh, even started this project, we had to plan for everyone's safety. Um, <clears throat> as uh, Dan mentioned, um, we worked on this project in the spring of 2021. Um, <clears throat> so COVID had been going for a while and um, we wanted to get this started and not wait because we didn't know how long the pandemic would last. Um, but at the same time, we wanted to make sure that everyone was safe. So we did a couple of things. One, we built this entire farm bot outside. Um, so luckily California has nice warm weather um, and the area that the community center gave us had an overhang so we could build it in the shade um, <clears throat> and it didn't rain. So <clears throat> we did build this thing outside. Uh, Dan had all the materials in her office and she would bring them out on a cart every single time. And we would, uh, she and I would coordinate in advance sort of how many pages of the manual we were going to try to accomplish each session. Um, and she would try to guess which pieces we needed, but um, usually everything just came down. And then we would sort things at the beginning of the session. Um, we limited the uh, work groups to four girls on site and two mentors and Dan. Um, <clears throat> we uh, had extensive COVID screening. Um, to make sure that everyone was well and wasn't having any symptoms. Um, and uh, back then we were all wearing masks outside. Um, we made the decision to actually purchase extra sets of tools. So the FarmBot came with a set of tools um, that were all you needed in order to build the farm bot, but they only sent one set. So uh, we purchased three more sets so that the girls would each have their own set uh, sanitized at the beginning, um, and then uh, we wouldn't have to share any tools. Um, <clears throat> also, the mentors brought their own power tools with them so <clears throat> that um, we didn't have to share those either. We worked on Sundays, which is when the community center and the library are both closed, so there was no one else around. Um, <clears throat> and that was good because there were thousands of small pieces that Navika will tell you about. Um, and this way we weren't disturbed. Um, and also we could sort of maintain a little bit of a bubble. Um, <clears throat> and in, in addition to this, um, the space cookies have standard operating procedures for doing any kind of work like this. So um, we followed all of those, which included wearing safety glasses at all times, um, having our hair tied back, um, wearing shoes that um, covered our feet. So even though it was warm, everyone came in closed-toed shoes and long pants. And that way, if we dropped anything, we wouldn't hurt ourselves. Uh, all our standard robot things. So Navika will now talk um, about the assembly experience. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So a huge challenge for us, as Susan mentioned, was just like the complexity of the FarmBot system. It was pretty hard to organize and coordinate because there was just so many different parts. Um, in the left photo, you can see Dan's work cube, which is full with boxes of parts of all sizes. These include things like aluminum extrusions, wires, sensors, chips, as well as a wide array of nuts and bolts. As Susan said before, each of our sessions involve four girls and we prepared beforehand by reading the specified pages of the manual, usually around 20 pages. And on our side, Dan organized, opened, and set up all of the parts needed. And even though across the various meetings, different girls were present, mentors like Susan and Dan helped us maintain continuity. Careful attention to detail throughout the whole process helped us run smoothly and created a solid foundation for the FarmBot's strong functionality and movement capabilities. In the photo on the right, 
you can see the central processing unit of the FormBot with the Raspberry Pi and the FormDuino chip. This is also where all of the cables connect in a complex network, and this enables the FormBot to move in three axes, so up and down, left and right, and back and forth. Uh, next slide, please. I'm just going to jump in quickly while that you saw on that slide, it had some links to um, list and of items and documents. I um, just want to let everyone know afterwards when the archive recording is ready um, is available, you will have this slide deck as well. Um, Dan already sent it to me. Um, and um, so that will be available to you. So these links to things and there's um, other resources and whatnot on the on the slides. Uh, don't worry about that. You will have access to that. Everyone will have access to that afterwards with the recording. Go ahead. Yeah. So, as Susan mentioned, this was a really long process of trial and error, but we gained invaluable knowledge throughout this. Um, as the FarmBot assembly consisted of well over 100 pages of instructions, we did run into a few technical issues just because of how intricate it was, and I'm going to briefly cover some of them. I vividly recall one of the first times. So, the wooden body of the planter has two long sliders along the edge, and it's on top of this that the FarmBot rolls. And the plates that attach it have wheels that are connected with eccentric spacers in them. So these are spacers that vary in thickness along the length of the spacer. And as this was something we had never worked with before, we didn't realize that this could like be a thing. And we didn't pay attention to the orientation of the spacers when assembling it the first time around. <clears throat> but after realizing the issue and a lot more experimentation with wheel location and spacer orientation, we were able to get the sliding functioning smoothly the third time. Another setback was on magnet polarity. The various gardening tools on the farm bot, such as the tools to plant seeds or pull out weeds, are attached by three magnets. And they weren't like obviously marked in polarity. So when we assembled it, we didn't really pay attention to it. And it didn't look that different even when the polarities were flipped. So it wasn't until later that we realized that we had to redo them. And that actually needed pretty precise angles on the magnets which we didn't realize earlier. Another temporary setback was from an impromptu decision made early on. This one was pretty nerve wracking because we had built the bot in the middle of the bike truck to optimize the space that it could cover because we thought that way it'd be able to access more of the planter. But what happened is after we had wired the cables, we realized that the tools need to be placed on one side of the planter and this means that the farm bot also needs to start from one side of the planter and go from there. However, after a lot of thinking, we were able to easily fix this by half unscrewing the base and just scooching the entire assembly over. Overall, we learned a lot and became a lot more resilient and adaptable through overcoming these issues. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So on the assembly side of things, in less than three months, we successfully completed the assembly phase and proceeded to set up the software environment for the farm bot. In the picture on the left, you can see just how many steps and sub-steps this process included. So this is getting kind of redundant, but we did run into a few more setbacks, which we had to identify and overcome. Um, so one of our first experiences with this was when the GAN through the farm bot would like come down towards the planter. And then it wouldn't go back up. So we contacted tech support. After suspecting that the motor either lacked power or didn't work properly, but they recommended the mechanical fix of applying graphite lubricant. However, when we tried this, this didn't help with our issue. Eventually, we contacted them again. And after an hour-long Zoom call with the tech support, we confirmed that the motor was faulty. Um, we eventually confirmed it by switching it with another motor. And after the other motor was placed in, it went up just fine. So that's how we knew that the motor was the issue. This was simply bad luck, as having a malfunctioning motor is very rare. And we were sent to free replacement, but it did delay the assembly process a little bit. Another issue on our end that was a quick fix after finding the problem was the air suction in the needle to suck up the seeds. Due to a misstep, the vacuum was blowing air out instead of sucking it in. Okay, well. I've mentioned mostly hardware problems so far. We also ran into a few software issues. For instance, we discovered that the FarmBot was unable to detect the attached tools despite proper installation, but this was fixed through extensive testing by Dan. 
It's also worth mentioning that the software tuning for the FarmBot differs a lot from that of readily made robots. With the FarmBot, the software must be carefully calibrated to align with our specific configuration of the FarmBot, meaning that we have to be very precise with our physical measurements and software adjustment. However, we were able to overcome all of these hurdles with determination and perseverance. And I'll pass it back to you, Dan. Okay, thank you so much, Navika. Um, so I'll continue talking about the programs we launched with FarmBot. Uh, we proudly showcase the FarmBot at various events, including the Rig Maker Fair and Health Fair, where it garnered significant attention and admiration. Additionally, we introduced a dedicated FarmBot program to engage the community. The Space Cookies Girls played a vital role in sharing our FarmBot journey with our customers, leaving them amazed and inspired by our project. Their enthusiasm and passion in conveying the story of the FarmBot project added an extra level of excitement and engagement to these, these events. Now, despite our best efforts, FarmBot encounters occasional hiccups during demos, just like any other technology. Similar to experiencing laptop malfunctions or app glitches on our phones, FarmBot can sometimes act up too. While the watering function has proven to be quite reliable, we did encounter an unexpected incident during a test run when the water pipe unexpectedly popped. Fortunately, there were no customers present at that moment. We quickly improvised a solution by using cable ties to secure the water pipe in place, ensuring that such an incident wouldn't occur again. And we also ran into many other uh, glitches during demonstrations. Story of my life. <laughs> Um, so, because the projects you now started during the pandemic, we also curated a dedicated YouTube playlist to make our project visible and accessible to more audiences. This playlist features videos that showcase the process of building the FarmBot, as well as demonstrations of how the FarmBot operates. By creating this playlist, we aim to offer a resource for anyone interested in learning more about the development and functionality of the FarmBot. I'm going to play this four minute long video. Uh, this video showcased uh, you know, how the space cookies helped building the FarmBot and we will have the chance to meet more space cookies girls who, help, who helped with the project in this video. At Palo Alto State Library, we recently built an agricultural robot farm bot. This is the first time that I have built a robot from scratch, and the project showcased our community's talent, creativity, and spirit. Hi, we are the Space Cookies, FRC Robotics Team 1868 and Girls Cart Troop 62868. Our lab is located at the NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View. Our team has 62 girls from 22 different high schools. We participate in many different STEM-based outreach events every year and are excited to help the library with our new FarmBot outreach project. Building the FarmBot has been very fun and we thank the library for giving us the opportunity to bring a new robot to Palo Alto. Hi, my name is Anjali and I work mostly on the moving components and the wheels of the FarmBot. And one challenge we faced was that the wheels here were not moving as swiftly as they could on the FarmBot and they were getting stuck in the treads. So how we fixed that is we used a type of washer called an eccentric spacer. And this is a type of washer that is different lengths at each angle of the spacer. And it let us adjust the length so it can move swiftly along the track instead of getting stuck. Uh, so the eccentric spacers work uh, by having different widths and different thicknesses on each side of the spacer. And that lets the wheel sit higher up or lower down uh, based on how we adjust it, which lets us move the wheels along the track more smoothly. I'm 
Catherine, and I worked mainly on the belt and some of the wiring on the farm bot. I'll introduce uh, a bit about some of the cabling. Um, over here, we have uh, cabling for the power supply and also the water supply. Up here, this cable carrier carries the most cables because it carries some of the cables for tools as well as for the motors. And over here, we have the cables for the tools. Uh, when we were working with these cable carriers, there are little tabs inside and we had to take each one of the tabs out and then lay all the cabling in and then put each of the tabs back in to make sure that everything stayed organized. Hi, my name is Paige and I mostly worked on the planner block for this FarmBot project. One uh, problem we faced during this project was keeping the wires inside the electrical box organized. And one way we overcame this challenge was to use phone spacers inside the box that would keep the wires evenly spaced and neatly organized. Bye, all. <laughs> well, it's been a while for us, but every time I watch the video, it reminds me of you know how much work we put into this. And it's I like the last screen and I also give a shout out to our to the other mentor at Space Cookies, Michael. Yeah. Um, oh, and oh, sorry, it started again. Let me use this. Okay, so aside from the, the video we just watched, I also highly recommend this video in our playlist. This is a very short but incredible time-lapse video showcases the entire journey of a carrot's growth from seed to harvesting. Over a span of six months, the farm bot diligently captured 160 photos, which have been compiled into this visually stunning video. I'm going to play it. It's only 20 seconds long. Definitely, I want to definitely yep. want to do that one. <laughs> so when you when you watch when you watch the video, I would like you to pay special attention to the far left side um, of of the video, because uh, it showcases you will witness the mesmerizing dance of a carrot as it sprouts, flourishes, and matures in the soil. And, and this unique perspective reveals the fascinating dynamics of vegetable growth that may have previously gone unnoticed, at least to me. Uh, I, I never know Kara's dance when they grow. Let's watch it. So how did it taste? <laughs> uh, I actually didn't test, taste it, but there are librarians who she carefully sliced, you know, this very first carrot and shared it with many other librarians. They say the test was amazing. And we also allowed our customers to take home a few of the carrots they harvested from the planting bed. Yeah. Should have made a library chicken soup. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea, yeah. If we ever have another batch of carrots, we should do that. <laughs> All right, I think next I'm going to actually provide you a very quick demonstration of the FarmBot software interface. 
So I will quit my slides and uh, let's go to the, okay. So here on this screen, this is a, a FarmBot software interface and it's accessible via the designer URL. You just need to create a login with your own FarmBot. And uh, on this page, what do you see here? Is uh, it's a representation of the bot. It's currently located at the lower uh, left corner and also the planting bed. Because we are building the smallest size of the farm bot, so it's just, you know, just one corner of the page. And on the top here, uh, these are the tools. And if I go to the tools page, and you can see this is the seeder. This is seed bean, the seed tray. You will put the seeds in the seed bean and the seed tray, and you use the seeder to section up the seed. And here's the watering nozzle. This is soil sensor, and this is the weeder. So this interface allows us to, you know, create custom programs. Um, and we can use these custom programs to ask a farm bot to perform specific tasks automatically. So if we move on to the event page, as you can see, I scheduled, um, I have a weekly schedule, uh, Mondays, to some, Mondays through Sunday, and I just scheduled on May 27th, ask the bot to, you know, um, watering all the plants every morning and then take capture some photos and I scheduled it pretty far ahead I think because by this time farm bot is we kind of already worked out most of the issues in the bot so it's probably it's just you know doing its automatic things on a daily basis and uh, let's go to here um, I just want to showcase, so these are the photos the farm bot takes. And if, if I want to, I can just, you know, ask it to take a photo right now where it's resting. And it'll just take the photo, send the request and showing up right here. All right, let me go back to my slides. All right. Okay. And I'm going to pass it on back to Susan and Navika again. Thank you. Okay. So what we learned. So as we're a robotics team, usually we design our robots for our annual competition. So this was a really unique opportunity for us to witness the design and manufacturing process of commercial robots and also learn a lot of valuable engineering tricks. Um, one of the ones actually turned out to be directly applicable to a robot. As you saw with the chains that are used to um, collect the wires in the back and on the top, those are IGIS chains, and those are the same ones that we used on our robot this year. However, a lot of the things aren't directly applicable to our robot, but definitely skills that we could use in the future. Um, some cool things that we learned about were indented notches, and these were just like on plates that were hard to align. So instead of having to worry about which holes go where, you can just line up the notch and which is, that's like a lot simpler. And also eccentric spacers, which I talked about earlier and also in the video, which allow you to make very slight adjustments to have more pre precise controls over things. So on space cookies, because we're a small girl without a team, the same people that design the robot build the robot. So we don't have to worry about following any instructions as we know where everything goes and we can like picture the entire assembly in our heads. But on this FarmBot project, we had to follow extremely detailed instructions, which was a new experience for us. And this taught us a lot about thinking about manufacturing process and thinking about how you're going to build it while you're designing. And overall, this project has been an incredible learning experience for everyone involved. It not only provided us with an opportunity to expand our knowledge and skills, but it also showcased the benefits of collaboration and the application of engineering principles in the real world projects. Okay, thank you, Navika. Um, and I'm going to talk about the lessons the library learned. So we successfully created a platform for community talent to shine 
and achieved our goal of promoting digital literacy with our community. Now, if your library is considering embarking on a similar project, there are several key elements you will need to ensure its success. First and foremost, assembling the right team is crucial. This includes garnering support from a leadership team who can provide guidance and resources throughout the project. Additionally, having skilled staff members who possess the necessary expertise in robotics and technology will greatly contribute to the project's execution. Engaging with the talent present in your community, such as local robotics enthusiasts or experts, can further enhance the project's success. Collaboration is paramount. Working closely with other departments within your organization will ensure a comprehensive and well-rounded approach. Collaboration also extends beyond the library or your organization, involving communication and coordination with vendors or suppliers and engaging the community in various capacities. Patience is a virtue especially when undertaking a pioneering project like this. It's important to remember that unforeseen challenges and uncertainties are bound to arise along the way. Embracing patience allows you to navigate these hurdles with a steady approach, learning from setbacks and adapting your strategies as needed. In addition to patience, be a daredevil. As libraries, we have a unique role in promoting lifelong learning and fostering growth within our communities. By involving on innovative pro projects like the FarmBot Initiative, we open new doors and provide exciting opportunities for our community members to explore and expand their horizon. Okay, thank you for your attention. We have now reached the final slide of our presentation. Please feel free to scan the QR codes on the screen to access my contact information and Space Cookies website. Um, Krista, I think we are open for questions. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, all right. Yeah, go ahead and keep that slide up for now. Um, and mm -hmm. we'll see uh, what people have questions about and if they want to look at anything else. Um, and yes, if anyone does have any questions, go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar webinar interface. Um, I'm monitoring that here. Um, and we will ask our presenters anything you're interested in. Uh, this was, uh, I'm very excited about this session. Like I said, it's very fun um, seeing how it works. I, I, I love robots and robotics. I'm not good at them. I've never really tried much with them. <laughs> um, so I'm very impressed, uh, Nevika, with everything you and your your teammates have done on, on this, things that I could never have even thought of. But it's just so fun to watch it and, and see, see it work. Um, and in the chat, I also, um, I found the origin story of the farm bot. And there was an updated version of it that just came out in August of 2022. And I found like a reference to a curriculum. And I was wondering, did that curriculum exist yet when you started this project? Uh, let me open that. I'll put a link to the curriculum I found too. Uh -huh. It looked like it's super new. So it might have actually just come out since that article came out too. Um, yeah. Oh, oops. Yeah, that's the page. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I'll put here's the link to would you mind opening up that curriculum and let me know if it is for the same the logo matched, but I want to make sure it's for the same product. Mm -hmm. It is for the same product and uh, they do have already have a documentation the time we run the project. However, um, if you go into the detailed levels of um, assembling the farm bot, especially in our case, we are assembling the minimum size of the farm bot. So there are certain steps in the documentation. It's just for the regular size. And okay. we have to, yeah, 
we have to customize the documentation and uh, customize it a lot in our needs. And also we are building it on this veggie chuck planter because there are two ways of using the farm bot. You can originally in our um, grant, as I mentioned, we were trying to use the outdoor yard um, in one of our branches. If we are going to use that yard, our plan was to use the bot directly on the ground. So just have, you know, you know, four pieces of wood on the ground set up, a very simple planter. But because we have to move it to the community center's corner, and it's a paved, already paved space, so we have to um, shift the direction and try to find the veggie, you know, identify the a planter that will work, elevated planter that will work with the farm bot. So that's another challenge. You know, we we have to uh, customize the, you know, the steps because we have these specific needs. Mm -hmm. I just thought that, of, that was a question that someone had. You're just talking about the different sizes and doing it on the ground or above. How big can this farm bot be? How much, you know, how big of a, like, what are the applications for going big, I guess? <laughs> how much, you know, how, yeah. So, um, I mentioned in one of the slides, let me see if I, I think it's on, um, um, identify the model. Mm -hmm. So they do offer these, uh, the one we have is a uh, Farm bot genesis. and the smallest size, the minimum size we can build, we which is what we built is, mm -hmm. I remember it's the width is point y, point 0.5 meter, and the length is 1.5 meter. Mm -hmm. Now, if you build a full size genesis, it's I think it's like four times, so it's like one meter width and three meter in length. Okay. Yeah. So a good size bed, yeah, for someone doing. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it looks like great. Farm. You know, you can harvesting more vegetables if you're building full size. Sure, but sure. in our case, because we have to put it on, you know, this paved ground, we have to use a elevated planter and elevated planter. The time I research and think, and also we're thinking the cost because we didn't put the planter cost elevated planter cost at least in the grant proposal so we have to you know um squeeze some budget out of the project to purchase this i think 200 or 300 elevated planter and the genesis itself at that time it was around 3000 bucks mm -hmm. okay and your planter is on wheels too so you can move it wherever you want to use it no, we are not. It's not on wheels because, oh, okay. like Susan ma mentioned, uh, the the bot requires you know the site leveled perfectly. Uh, if you okay. install wheels, it will add you know extra like uh, difficulty. Don't want to mess with that. No, no, no. Yeah. You don't want to do that. Were you saying oh, something else, Amanda? I just saw the farm bot was on sale. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Timing to get one. <laughs> right. I was interested. That How was much is it on sale for now? <laughs> yeah. Oh, all right. Um, oh, should I put the link to this product page? Yeah, sure. We can share that. Yeah. Um, we do have questions. So, yeah, anybody have any questions? Get them into the question section. Um, we're almost at 11 o'clock, but that's okay. 11 o'clock central time, but that's okay. We'll go as long as it takes for all of you to get your questions asked in the audience and for um, all of our presenters to uh, say everything they want to about it. Um, someone who does want to know that today, so first I say the farm, farm bot is very attractive. Is there a recommended age for assembly? Like what would you consider the minimum age for someone to be able to do something like this? How, what were the ages of the girls who did do it? So uh, they are high school students. Our, our, yes, group, our group is uh, high school girls, um, okay. and I don't think I would recommend doing this with a group that's younger. Um, mm -hmm. 
it some of the sections are relatively straightforward and other pieces really um took a uh, you, you just really had to focus in um, as navika mentioned uh, when we first tried to put the sliders together it took them three tries mm -hmm. um and uh, uh it it uh, it involved a lot of lock nuts, um, which had to be unlocked. Uh, and um, I, I just don't think that you could do this with a group that's younger. Yeah, I agree. And one question I did have was about the maintenance of it. Like, I love hearing how it was all built and put together. Like, that was amazing. And then I wondered, once it's all together, how often do you have to update like the software firmware and do like maintenance mode on it? That's a very good question. I do recall some emergency moments. I need to, you know, just go where the farm bot is and do a careful calibration again, because uh, especially, you know, this bot, it's sitting outside, you know, 24 seven, and in the sunshine, in the rain, and uh, and inevitably, um, some parts will move. And uh, I, I would say the most difficult part that need more careful calibration was the tools. So for the farm bot to, uh, like here you see on this screen, uh, the long the z axis the you know the the long stick in the middle that's that's the the bot the moving part and they'll use magnets to um attract the tools on the tool bay sorry excuse me um in the tool bay in the far end and you have to tell the bot exactly where how to lower down itself to get to the point of the tools. And it, it cannot have over like five millimeters of difference. If anything happened, you know, the, then you have to recalibrate everything. Um, and I do recall recently, I think um, I used some checks, <laughs> but recently it's been more stable. But mm -hmm. at the beginning, when we first, you know, when we first um, assembled everything and tuning with, with software, I remember every week I need to come in and recalibrate it, give it a new number. Like, is it five millimeter or you know down to three millimeters now? <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a very tedious troubleshooting process. And like, and what's the lifespan of the motors? Because I like, I know most CNC machines. That's usually what goes first. Have you had to change them out much? The motors, uh, except you know, during the assembling process, Susan, we discovered the malfunctioning motor, and they sent in the new one. Um, otherwise, it's been functioning. The motors has no problem at all. For all these years, it's been functioning. It's still, um, I think, it's still pretty in good, in pretty good shape. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yes or or yeah or you can say what well, like you yeah. <laughs> we had a C, like cnc machine that had to get the motor changed out like almost every year wow. so it's either just like bad parts or just like bad mm. luck <laughs> you know amanda and interesting you mentioned that it's not the farm bot but our now robot does run into motor issues. It has two legs. If you, I, I don't know if you ever recall, um, and it'll do dances, but then, you know, the legs, the motors on the leg just couldn't sustain for a very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These hardware, you know, we got the robot and, you know, the hardware part, it's, 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 it will never last forever. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> and uh, I most recently, actually, you know, FarmBot was our last year's, like we concluded last year. So most recently I was working on another um, 
PLP grant project, we call it Light Up Your Library, and it's a Jones program. And uh, we were using those uh, DJI RoboMaster Jones. And in the grant proposal, I specifically mentioned, you know, uh, for the Jones, it's the same case. It won't last forever, uh, but with, you know, people with knowledge of the Jones, we're taking good care of it. We know what we're doing, what we're uh, scripting for the Jones to perform. Um, maybe we can make them last for one to two years. Because I have the DJI Tello drone set right now, and it's always the propellers that go first. Yeah, the propellers, they need to, the four propellers, they need to be, once they dropped, you have to put them in, the, put them back in, in a very specific way because they have directions. If you yeah. put them back in, in the wrong way, they won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Those are the details. Are they yeah. also maybe the most delicate part of the drone too? Yeah, if they, for example, like the drone hits the wall and it falls down, <laughs> then the propeller, one of the propeller will just fly out for sure and you have to reassemble it back. I'm so familiar with it now. Yeah. We, with the grant, we have, you know, multiple uh, RoboMaster drones. It's very similar to the Tello drones. They are all both manufactured by uh, DJI. Last year, we also, because we are collaborating with the San Jose State University iSchool, so they provided us uh, a free telogen last year we launched a program with it this year we were doing it with the robomaster jones this robomaster jones you can do a program a light show with them and they will also flip forward flip backward doing group dances the program was amazing but uh, yeah it's just a hardware it's very tricky yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm i feel your pain <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this um, project that you're doing here of the the farm bot is this? You, know, you said you had a grant to get this going. Is this now an ongoing project program? Is it, um, what is is there an end? I mean, you see, you have those still those other robots you're still doing things with. Is this going to be? You know, what's the plan forward with this? That's a very very good question, Krista, and I don't have a very good answer for that, unfortunately. So yeah, like I mentioned, the robotics programs we have at the library, I think all of them so far we've run, it's all sponsored by uh, Grant and Grant has their grant period. Most of them, it's like one year. After one year, it walks into that gray area. Mm. So especially for Palo Alto City Library, we are a small, municipal library and we don't have that many staff um you know we only have 50 less than 60 staff and uh, i am the one that leading the robotics projects in our library we just don't have that much manpower to maintain all these different robotics projects we started like I mentioned, the now robots, Dewey robots, the farm bot, the Jones. Um, so it's it's being it, it becomes more and more of a challenge for our for us to think about the future of this robot and to think about their sustainabilities. But fortunately, <laughs> last year the um, like I mentioned the I score, so they reached out they reached out to us for a partnership. And, and Dr. Anthony Chow at the I school, I think he's very visionary. His idea is to have a, a library technology integration lab. So where the I school will actually purchase and own all these different hardware pieces, and they will collaborate with different libraries in the California state and or even beyond nationwide and then we will together we will you know um, collaborate and develop documentations and the program documentations included and provided um, free to all the library partners I think that is a great idea 
And uh, I've been working with Dr. Chow closely since last year. We've also presented the idea um, at last year's ALA. I believe Dr. Chow is going to uh, present this idea again um, to this year's ALA conference. And mm -hmm. we've already kind of established um, a few projects. For example, the now robots I've worked on, we shared all the documentations, the GitHub re uh, repositories, also the Jones, we share the GitHub repository, and iSchool is building a web page to assembling all this information. And they are working on, you know, um, purchasing all these hardwares. So I'm, I'm hoping in the future, um, for you know, technology projects, mm -hmm. we could find a more sustainable way. Um, because I, you know, I've been doing this for this is also my sixth year uh, mm -hmm. at Palo Alto City Library. The more I work on technology projects, the more I feel there's a need. Um, you know, we need to focus on the sustainability side. So thank you so much for asking this question. I got a little giddy when you said that because I've been working on like a similar project. We've been calling it the Tech Hub, which is basically like a collection of guides and like a resource repository to help libraries get started with it, learn how to use it and do programming. So I wonder if we put our both of our stuff together. Oh, maybe yeah. We, it we, over. Should, we should do that. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. You guys need to talk more, Def absolutely. <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, partnerships, that's the key to some of these things. As you said, as you described, Dan, libraries yeah. are short on staff, short on budgets, and finding anyone in the community, any partners are definitely the, the way to get these kind of things going and survive and, and keep them going. And I hope that that does keep happening, absolutely. Yeah. Because we've been building a separate portal, but instead of going and building that whole thing, if you already have something, then we could just funnel it over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad I got you guys talking. You're both talking. <laughs> um, I got one last question I want to ask, and I think we'll wrap things up. And this is about the space cookies, actually, um, that, that you have the uh, robotics team there. Is this something that's just at in California at in your particular group, or can other Girl Scout groups start up one of these? How would a, a Girl Scout group get one of these space cookies robotics team things going for themselves? Uh, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, um, uh, we are a specialty Girl Scout troop. Uh, so uh, Girl Scouts of Northern California um, was a uh, uh, reached out from NASA uh, back in 2006 when they wanted to start a robotics team for girls. Um, because the uh, NASA is a big supporter of something called FIRST, which mm -hmm. is for inspiration. Uh, oh God, I've forgotten the entire thing. It's um, no, I okay. that one. Do you know what F I R S T stands for. For inspiration, I forgot what the R is. Science and technology. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyway, it, this is an organ, international organization started by Dean Kamen, who is the Segway guy, um, oh. and uh, it's to spread STEM excitement um, in um, kids, uh, to encourage more people to go into STEM. And um, NASA is a big supporter of this program. They've been a supporter from the beginning, um, and they sponsor. Um, robotics teams all over the country um, and uh, they had started a team uh, in collaboration with a boys school out here in the Bay Area and they wanted to start a girls team and so they had reached out to Girl Scouts and um, Girl Scouts of Northern California had said uh, absolutely we can start a specialty team a specialty troop that um, is uh, going to work under under this organization so um, we are not only a girl scout troop but we are also a first uh, robotics competition team um, mm -hmm. and first robotics competition teams exist all over the world um, i believe that there are teams in all 50 states in the u.s um, most of them are high school teams um, i am sure that there are teams in nebraska um, <laughs> oh, and, <there> are. <laughs> 
Right. So um, that that is the organization that we are uh, that we compete under. Um, so if some other group wanted to do that, that's who they should reach out to find out who is their first robotics team in their area, and then they could. Um, right. Right. Yes. So there are plenty of first robotics teams um, all over every state in the uh, in the U.S. Nice. All right. And, and it'll it, brings, it goes through UNL's extension office, and oh. they have a repository of like all of them. And apparently it stands for for inspiration and recognition in science and technology, which I was never going to remember. <laughs> you are arguing me every time. <laughs> I would not have thought recognition. Yeah, no. right. <laughs> but it makes sense. Cool. Uh, all right. Um, does anybody have any last minute desperate questions they would like to ask of our speakers? Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. Um, I see everyone has stuck around while we've been chatting here. Um, if you have anything last you want to ask, get it into the question section. Um, and while we're waiting to see if anything comes in, I'll start my, uh, I'm going to bring presenter control back to my screen here and uh, talk about what we're going to be putting up for our recording. All right. Um, we got some thank yous coming in. Thank you, presenters. This is very fun. So these are some of the links that um, Amanda was sharing that she had found, as you said, the, the web page for the um, FarmBot to order it and um, that it is, yep, on sale. Both of them, they are on sale. So you could uh, get either the smaller one or the XL uh, if you wanted to uh, at discount prices. And they've got the FarmBot Expresses. Are these on sale too? Yeah, everything's on sale. Yeah. Sweet. So, um, yeah. So when I um, do, well, I'm going to put up the archive for this i will put links to all these things that um we have here there's the order it um the educational resources uh this is the page that um the about the how it started i'll include That's all those cool. as well as link to uh dan slides so you'll have links to everything here when the archive is up were you saying something amanda that i missed no? um just that i was geeking out with that article <laughs> Yeah, it's very cool. And you can see here, they, they, I like they have this comparison of the two different sizes at that time that you can see how they compare to each other. They also talk a lot about proprietary technology and how that's like more harmful for farmers because they can't build their own equipment. Yeah. And like a lot of the challenges that farmers face. So it's a cool article. You should read it. In general, yeah, for agriculture. Um, Open source, we love open source. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so um, I don't see any other desperate questions coming in, so we will wrap things up. Yeah, thank you everybody for being here. Thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, I said we are recording the show, and if you just um, use your search engine of choice, and I'm just gonna go up here and type in Encompass Live, we are the only thing called that on the internet so far. Yay, look at that, all us. Um, and you will find our Encompass Live main webpage and our archive page. Uh, these are our upcoming shows. Everyone's welcome to sign up for those. Uh, this is where our archives go. There's a link underneath our list of upcoming shows. Most recent ones at the top of the page. So today's show will be up there. Should be ready uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. Uh, we also push that out onto our social media, onto Twitter for the Library Commission. We have a Facebook page for the show. So if you are on Facebook, like to use that, give us a like and you'll see reminders about shows. Here's a the reminder to log in today's show, um, introducing our presenters and speakers. And then here is when last week's recording was available. So we do post those kind of things up there and we use the uh, hashtag, a little abbreviation of the show name, and Comp Live. So you can look for that on Twitter, Facebook. I think our uh, communications people go uh, put stuff out onto um, the Instagram as well. Um, I will show you while we're here on our archives. You can search our show archives if you're looking for some, see if we did something on a particular topic. You can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something just current. And that is because this is our full show archives. I'm going to scroll down a little bit here, but not all the way, because this is a giant page, as you can see. Uh, this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. 
So we have 15 years, I think, what we're going on of recordings here. And they're all available, all up on our YouTube channel uh, for the Library Commission. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date of any show. Um, they all have the dates here when they first were done. Uh, some of the shows will stand the test of time and still be great, use, good resources, but some things will become old and outdated. Uh, resources and services may have changed drastically or no longer exist anymore. Links may be broken. People will probably not work at the same library that they presented uh, from like 10 years ago, possibly. <laughs> so just be aware of that um, as you are watching any of our recordings. Um, but this is one thing that libraries do is keeping things for historical purposes. And as long as we have somewhere to host all of our archives, uh, we will keep them out there for everyone to watch. All right, so uh, as I said, this is the last Wednesday of the month, our Pretty Sweet Tech Day, and we do have our next two Pretty Sweet, De Pretty Sweet Tech <laughs> sessions scheduled and our topics available. So if you're interested in that, um, actually our new um, IT person. Uh, Good old Sherm. Andrew Sherm, yeah, he's a new on our computer services team, is going to be uh, coming on and talking about the end of July, May, June, <laughs> uh, about securing your computers for public use, so computer security, and then at the end of July, talking about internet filtering for SIPA and any other reasons that you might want to filter. So uh, Sherm's going to be joining us uh, on those two uh, pretty sweet texts. And you can see all of our other shows coming up. We are fully got all our shows up here for the summer. Um, uh, I'll start working on August a little later. <laughs> so please register for any of our shows. Like I said, free and open to anyone. And next week, we are going to be having, you mentioned UNL staff from our University of Nebraska libraries talking about In Search of the Obscure, using library and online sources to find resources that are out of the ordinary. So we have um, staff people from UNL right here in Lincoln that are going to be talking about interesting things you can find um, in, in your searches. So please do sign up for that or any of our other shows. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And hopefully we'll see you at a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. And Dan, I'm going to email.